Welcome to today's educator content series on supporting productive struggle during the lesson. Um, it is brought to you by ASI and the Division of Teaching and Learning, and I'm partnering today with um, DC Public Schools with Gabe Cartagena from the Secondary Math Office. And um, one of our goals over here at ASI is to provide um, research-based high-quality professional development and support. And one of the ways that we're doing that is by highlighting the high leverage practices that have been found to increase the likelihood of positive um, learning outcomes for all students. And so throughout today's session, you'll see that little yellow box appear on the screen. And I'll try and speak to that and um, how whatever we're talking about at the time is a high leverage practice and how you might implement that into your classroom. I'll go ahead and start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Tanaga Rogers, and I am the math content specialist over at ASI. And I'm presenting with Gabe. Gabe, you want to introduce yourself? Of course. Uh, my name is Gabe Cartagena. I'm the director for secondary math for DC Public Schools. Excited uh, to be here and sad that this is the last time uh, that we're doing this together, at least for this session. Yes, today is our final session in this series, but there's more to come, so don't be too sad. Um, on the screen are some norms for today's session. I'll give you a moment just to read through those. And if you'd like to add anything, you can put that in the chat. And thank you so much for throwing your introductions in there. Hey, Chantel, glad to see you back. All right, so let's take a look at our agenda for today. We're going to spend some time at the top of the hour talking about understanding the struggle that students experience. Um, and then we will talk about some of the research and recommendations with regards to how to support students when they're actually in the struggle, in the task. What are some things, teacher moves that we can do to support them? We'll also walk through some classroom examples. So you'll be able to walk away today with some templates and things that you can use in your classroom with your students. And then as always, we like to take time at the end to think about how and what we might implement um, in our space. So as Gabe mentioned, today is the final um, session in our little mini series here. However, what's coming down the pike is a book study, which many of you have signed up for. We're all full now, but there will also be some other additional opportunities um, coming up that I'll share at the end of the session as well. But um, we do have a book study that will be happening. If you are interested, even though it's full, you can shoot me an email and we'll um, see maybe if we can either get you um, on the wait list or for maybe our next round of book study in the spring. All right, so let's dive in. We're going to start by talking about um, what does it look like? What does productive struggle actually look like during the lesson with our students? Uh, thanks, Tanaga. So previously, we kind of talked about like what is productive struggle, right? Uh, we looked at some of the characteristics of some task um, that would lead to productive struggle. Today, we're going to focus on what um, what do you do when you recognize that students are experiencing this struggle? Um, and to kind of uh, center ourselves for today's learning, we come back to this graphic um, that really highlights the level of cognitive um, strain that students are going through when they are experiencing uh, productive struggle. So this kind of overlap where a task is both accessible yet challenging for students, um, as well as the definition definition here on the right uh, from our lovely book uh, that we've been diving into. Um, and you could take a couple of seconds just to reread that to yourselves. With those two things in mind, uh, we want to take a moment just to uh, listen some feedback from you all and thinking about uh, how do we know when the students are struggling in your math class? What might what are some things that you might hear students say or what are some things you see students 
Okay, so it's going to open up our collaborate board. Let's take a moment to respond and we'll lift up some of your comments. And there's about half of us that aren't in there yet. So I, I put the directions again in the chat box. So if you're not in the Nearpod, you'll want to join so that you can um, participate and share your ideas. Um, and we have some other activities in there as well. So um, you want to go to nearpod.com and then click on the box to join as a student and enter that code IPB95. Thanks, Naga. So we see a lot of a lot of comments coming through. We'll try and uh, pick up some on some trends, but um, disengagement is, is definitely something that uh, Tisha mentioned. Um, students may not attempt to choose the task uh, or attempt the tasks rather. Um, students are asking questions. Um, students uh, might demonstration. They might be quiet. Um, I see Courtney mentions that students are. I don't know. We're silent during the small group discussions. Uh, and uh, students are doing other. Not familiar with DIP 6. Um, may. You, you might have to uh, school me on that one. Um, yeah, I want to hear so more about that too, Renee. Feel free to <laughs> unmute yourself and tell us what that one means. <laughs> Um, I just do a diff stick and, you know, are they understanding or not letting self report? Oh, okay. So it's like a, it's kind of giving me some sort of visual cue or self assessment on where they are. Um, Sour mentioned that in this virtual space, we're seeing students just type anything um, so that they're kind of showing that they're participating when cognitively maybe they're they're not they're not with us um, at that moment. Um, definitely definitely a lot of trends and, and I want to make some connections to uh, also that graphic that we were thinking about when when a task is so challenging right for students that or it isn't accessible to students. These are some of the behaviors that, that we are going to that we are going to see. Um, similarly, if a task is too, um, too accessible, then we're also going to see some boredom uh, happening with students. Um, so thank you for, for, for sharing uh, some of those behaviors or some of those common behaviors. Um, in the book, um, they highlight a couple of common behaviors um, that some of which obviously are things that you mentioned. Uh, but they kind of classify them in this way, um, and for the purposes of our learning today, uh, we're just going to kind of focus on these couple of behaviors. Um, not to say that this is the most comprehensive list, uh, but some of those behaviors are um, students being unable to get started. So that's kind of that accessibility piece, right? Um, either the task is inaccessible for students or, or perhaps um, they just lack the skills um, to, uh, to access it or get started with it. Um, difficulty using a process. Um, so maybe they know what to do. Um, they just don't know how to do it. Um, trouble calculating is a, is a common uh, struggle that we see in mathematics. Um, so some of that fluency or, or maybe gaps in fluency. Uh, unable to stay with the task. Uh, so some people mentioned frustration um, or distraction, right? They start doing other things. Uh, so being able to stick with a task for an extended period of time. Um, and then the last one is around uncertain um, explanation. So having difficulties um, describing what they're doing. Um, so these are com common uh, types of struggles, which we'll lean into today and also think about what are some strategies to support students uh, when we see them exhibiting these behaviors. Uh, so last week, again, we focused primarily on like, how do we create tasks that will allow students to uh, productively move through it or access it um, in, a, in, a, in a way that's cognitively demanding. Uh, and that is gonna help students support the struggle. But today we're also gonna focus on what are some of the teacher moves 
Uh, and what are some of the actions that we can take in the moment to support students um, during these tasks? And that's where we're going to focus our attention today. So we've got a little poll here for you. We want to know whether or not you've ever collected any data formally or informally about the kinds of struggle that your um, students are experiencing. Like, have you ever either formally taken like tally marks or frequency chart or informally just observed and then acted on on your observations around student struggle? So you're on a bit of a timer here. There's about 15 seconds left. So go with your first gut response. Don't think about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> of what you might do with this data. Um, for those of you joining us with our book study, we will dig into this a little bit more and also uh, think about more formalized ways to collect data on these student behaviors uh, around struggle. So uh, those of you that are going to join us in our book study, we'll, we'll have plenty of time to dig um, deeper into this. Uh, but for those of you that haven't, uh, we'll be shifting our focus to think of what do we do when we student when we see students exhibiting these behaviors. And I'm just real curious, Gabe, I want to throw it out there. Those of you that said, yes, you do collect data and it's formal. I'm just curious, throw in the chat box for share with us some of the ways that you collect that data. So how are you gathering that? Give us some ideas um, for those of us that are collecting it, but doing it informally or not collecting it at all, haven't thought to collect it yet. So share with us in the chat. Thanks for uh, sharing that, Ms. Allow. Um, we'll actually take a look at a Desmos today, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, I think it's Ms. Chai right. mentioned okay. exit slip data. Mm -hmm. Hash marks. <laughs> <laughs> Love the hash marks. Uh, Ms. Jacobs also mentioned the, the use of student polls at the end of the lesson. Awesome stuff. All right, so for this next set, oh, Kahuta, that's a favorite of mine. Um, so for this section, we are going to talk about five tips um, to help you or five instructional moves that you could do um, to support students when they struggle. So I'm going to ask that if you haven't gotten a piece of paper or something to take some notes on or open up a new window to jot down these five action steps um, that might help you navigate the next five tips that we're going to give. And there's several of them in the book and we'll dive deeper if you're part of the book study and you'll have opportunities to like try them out in your classroom as well. So the first one is set the stage. And this was just the idea that you would prep your students in advance prior, right before you start the task, right? So that they are um, in a mindset ready to be like, okay, I'm probably going to struggle a little bit in the task that the teacher is about to give me. Um, and prepping them in advance in the same way that you would do right before class ends, like make sure you gather all your materials, right? You would prep students for that or at the beginning of class, make sure you have your notebook and your pencil and whatever the things are that they need. Same idea here, setting them up for success by preparing them in advance. Um, some of the ways that you might spend time reminding students is with some of those class norm charts that we talked about in the very beginning in session one. So connecting back to building that community of struggle and what is setting that expectation, reminding them of the expectation that we struggle in math class. That's a part of learning mathematics um, and reminding them. So we've got um, that norms chart that you see on the screen, the when you are stuck. And that was a, a Google Jamboard that we suggested. So you could make any of your digital uh, anchor charts. You can, I mean, any of the char anchor charts that you would have had in your classroom, you can make them digital in Jamboard and uh, have students add to them with sticky notes and so forth, and then refer back to them throughout the year. 
maybe it's a slide that you pull up um, right before you begin your task. Other ideas are to showcase a student's strategy in previous lessons, remind them of other times when they've struggled in math, but how we all got through it and we were able to solve that tough problem last month or whatever um, the scenario might be for your class. Um, oh, and my got my that yellow high leverage practice over there in the top corner. So this strategy or instructional move is actually um, a high leverage practice as well. So when we take time to teach students those metacognitive strategies, how to think about their thinking, um, we are actually supporting learning and independence. And so that is one of the uh, instructional practices that also has been shown to improve learning for all students. All right, tip two, catch and release. This one always makes me think about uh, baseball, but um, I guess fishing also. Um, but this is really a, a, a strategy that is, encompasses probably the whole entire lesson. Um, it's basically this idea that when students are working on a task, there comes this point where there's um, where many of the students might get stuck or they, there might be lots of questions or people might um, begin to get frustrated. And so this would be the point where you would stop the group, um, stop the, the lesson and have the entire group come together as a class. So have those pairs, those partners or the individual students, have everybody come back together and discuss a question. You might make connections between some of the ideas you've seen groups working on. So you might elevate, okay, I saw this pair they came up with this idea. Will you share that with the rest of the group? And so that group's knowledge might um, elevate the whole group and, and uh, help other groups move along. Um, exploring things that you've seen from other groups, either that were correct or incorrect and discussing them. Not just focusing in on the what answers or the uh, processes and strategies that are moving in the right direction, but also elevating those ones that aren't so that students can, again, do that metacognitive thinking and think about okay, I'm doing this, but it's not working. And why might not it be working and allowing other students to kind of facilitate that discussion um, as opposed to the students always looking to the teacher to be the one to say, no, but you're not on the right track. Um, and then, so after you have that, the, that uh, whole class time, maybe 10, 15 minutes where you have that brief discussion, the release part comes is that you let the students get back to work without coming to any sort maybe of uh, an answer. So it's not that we're gonna work on the problem together now and solve it completely, but it's more so let's just combine all of our ideas, let's share the thinking that we've uncovered so far, and then take that back to your group and finish working on the problem. And we'll talk some more about this one, and we actually have a video example um, that we'll share as well so that you can get a real picture of what that looks like. But that cycle could be repeated multiple times throughout um, a lesson as well. And there's another high leverage practice there. Level uh, high leverage practice number 22, being able to provide students with feedback to guide their learning and behavior. And key word there, I think, is guide and not uh, tell them the answer or tell them what they should be doing next, but to just gently guide them in the right um, direction or to give them feedback that would be helpful. So let's stop for a moment and think about what kinds of questions would be great for you to ask during that class time together. So once you observe, okay, most of the class is kind of getting stuck at this point on the question, um, let's come back together as a group and discuss what kind of questions would be great for that discussion time that don't lead the students too much towards the answers, but just gives them just enough guidance to work. So we're going to give you some questions that you can evaluate and test yourself, see what you think would be great for um, a catch and release instructional move. So the options there, just in case there's a few of you that aren't in the your pod. So the options are, uh, what did you do when? What is the opposite of division? Do you understand how Mason solved the problem? Or what might be another way to show? You want to throw in the chat box if you weren't able to get into your pod, you can do that as well.
You've got about 20 seconds left if you're still thinking about it. All right, would someone like to share one of their um, answer choices? Like, which ones did you choose? Um, which questions do you think would be best suited for catch and release? And you can feel free to either answer in the chat or unmute yourself. We'd love to hear people talk as well. Hi, so um, my very first instinct was to go to what might be another way to show. Uh huh. Um, because usually it's more than one entry point and stuff like that. So it jogs. And the second one I chose is what did you do when? Yeah. Those are only two. Yep. I think both of those are very open and allow for uh, multiple students to share. And there's not just one uh, answer, right? We're not leading students towards something. Whereas if you chose what's the opposite of a division, you're kind of cueing students to, oh, we're supposed to be looking for the opposite of division, right? Um, as opposed to letting students um, just share their current understanding of the problem. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anybody else that'd like to add on to that? Like, why did you choose why it might, what might be another way to show or what did you do when? All right, so the next um, instruction move is referrals. And I'm curious to know what comes to mind when you think of referral. Is it doctors, Google? <laughs> Google came to mind for me. Um, but a referral is basically any kind of tool that helps students advance their thinking. Um, think of a, think of yourself as an adult, right? Like if you want to try out a new recipe or you have a quick question about, oh, this broke in my house, how do I fix it? You use a referral. You probably more than likely you go and Google it or you look in a cookbook or somewhere else um, that has some ideas to get you thinking about whatever the problem is. In the same way, we uh, can do that for our students as well. Yep, I see people already putting some in the chat box, some great referrals, graphic organizers, number lines, yep. And a lot of times, I think in the secondary classroom in particular, um, students don't initially gravitate to these tools. Um, so you might need to encourage them to do so or set the stage for it and remind students that these tools are there for them. Um, these might be things like anchor charts. And remember, you can always transform those to be digital and uh, have those up in the, on the screen or on a, a link for students uh, that they can always go back to. Um, Gabe sh shared this wonderful resource that you see on the screen. It's a one-stop shop link for students with all different types of virtual math manipulatives. So um, we've got that link for you on the Wakelet and it's all um, available for you. I've also got some templates and some other places where you might find math manipulatives for students. Um, in addition to the manipulatives that are being shared in the chat box, like the number line and so forth, you also might want to think about graphic organizers. Someone mentioned the Freyer model. We're going to share some examples of some graphic organizers that work well for um, productive struggle as well, helping students think about well, what strategies have I already done and um, where might I go next with that? Or what are three things I have completed in the problem so that they don't get so discouraged by I haven't arrived there yet, right? Um, and then on the left, I wanna highlight real quick, uh, you can also use uh, manipulatives such as a multiplication chart or equivalent ratio table. And I know sometimes in the secondary classroom, we kind of shy away from those tools. We don't want students to be too dependent. They should know their facts already. Um, however, you can always modify those and block out the parts that students do already know so that there's only a limited amount um, that's available to them, just the ones that they need most that they maybe don't have readily available for recall just yet. Yep, Teresa says, get your calculator. That's right, a calculator counts for this one as well. 
as, as a referral. Taking notes. Yeah, good examples coming in the chat box. Keep them coming. All right, the next one is metacognitive questions. Um, this one we kind of talked a little bit about earlier when we were speaking about setting the stage um, and teaching students those metacognitive strategies so that they support their own learning and, and independence and don't become dependent learners, always looking for the teacher to tell them where to go and what to do next. These metacognitive questions are the questions that you're probably asking yourself when you're working on a problem. So we talked last session about actually in the planning phase that you would do the math problem, do the work yourself and anticipate where students get stuck. So when you're working through that process, whatever questions you're asking yourself as you're working through the problem, like, well, what might be a good estimate or where do I think the answer is going to be about or how could I work backwards? Those questions that you would ask yourself are the same questions that you would ask your students and think out loud. Say those aloud for them as well. And this is also a good place to, to jot them down um, when you're planning. So when you're planning, you might want to think about what metacognitive questions you would ask the students at these particular points throughout instruction. Another benefit there to planning for that struggle in advance. All right, this is number five and probably one that maybe you've done on your own without even really realizing like, oh, this is a, a good instructional move, but um, it's the idea of removing the numbers, filtering out the noise of numbers and being able to just focus on the problem, comprehending what the problem is about. So sometimes that looks like actually taking the numbers out of the problem and gradually putting them back in. Sometimes that looks like choosing different numbers to start the task maybe more friendlier numbers, um, and then replacing those numbers with the actual numbers once students get a, a handle on what the problem is asking. Um, and we also want to elevate here the three read strategy because this is another version of uh, this instructional move, removing the numbers. How many of you are familiar with three reads? Row in the chat. Give me a yes if you're familiar. I would say raise your hand, but I think Gabe and Daryl are the only ones with the camera on. I saw your hand go up, Gabe. Anybody else familiar with three reads? Okay, a couple people, Courtney. So the three read strategy, um, I'm just gonna quickly go through it, but you can always Google it later. And I think we have some references on the Wakelet. But the first time that you read the problem, you actually, there's no numbers in the problem. The students are just supposed to answer the question, what's the situation about? They're supposed to restate the entire question in their own words and just tell what's happening. And then the second time the student reads the question, again, the numbers are in the problem and they're only describing what are the quantities. So the number 34 describes fill in the blank. The number 200 describes or is talking about the number of shoes I gave away or whatever the problem is about. And then that third time that students read the problem, they talk about what are all the possible mathematical questions that could be asked about this scenario. Anything you want to add there, Gabe, that maybe I didn't touch on? No? Okay. Yeah, I was, uh, and okay. I put it in the chat. Was, <laughs> and it, uh, it's a great strategy for our English learners as well. And so I know that's that's sometimes a challenge is how do we how do we support our English learners um, or our special education students, this is a this is a great way you can do that. Yeah, and I've actually I did this once in a PD where um, we had the problem in a completely different language, um, and then we went through the three read strategy to experience what that's like as a as an English learner or as a, a student learning a language. It's very helpful. All right, so now we're going to dive deeper into two of those examples, um, two of the five strategies that we talked about earlier. So Gabe is going to show you now what it might look like in a secondary classroom. Thanks, Anago. You're muted. Oh, am I unmuted now? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, uh, so while I gave us some kind of high level framing of uh, a couple of different strategies, we're going to focus in uh, and look at a couple of examples of two of those. Uh, so the first of which is the catch and release. 
uh, which Tanaga described as uh, pausing in the middle of instruction or perhaps when students are working on a task to bring them all together to discuss kind of where they are in the process. Um, and Tanaga is going to show us a video of a secondary math classroom where the teacher um, does this. <laughs> Well, you usually you don't want to interrupt the entire class while they're working. Occasionally, there may be an observation or an idea so vital that everyone should know about it. On those occasions, it's okay to briefly gather students together in order to share, say, a method of organization or some critical observation, and then let students get back to work. Sharing problem-solving strategies like simplifying the problem or creating a table can potentially provide a framework to help students stay engaged for the rest of the class period. And these are game-changing strategies for students to have in their tool belt. However, do keep your interruptions infrequent and brief. I'm gonna get everyone to come to the front and we're gonna have a bit of a chat about what we've learned. So just as you were at the start of the lesson, teachers, scientists, them, we have no shame when it comes to making things as simple as possible in order to train ourselves to get the right idea. What if I make things even easier? said, all right, there's two counters. Would you like to go first when there's two counters? Yes. Yeah. Let's give that a go, shall we? Stop for a moment. Some amazing work is taking place. Can you describe what you found? I found if you have a squareable number and you subtract it by three, you just have a squareable number. So if we have 25, for example, we subtract it by three, we get 22. Let's use Ethan's original drawing. This is five by five, so this is 25. You then eliminated four. To make it one, just a couple more minutes. Go. Another excellent habit to develop when running rich tasks is to ask questions rather than give answers. When a student asks you a question and they're really sort of looking for a confirm or deny sort of response from you, in everyday life you might just be tempted to, to answer that question simply on face value. But what's really necessary, I think, is that you reflect the question back to the student. Is it So that was a uh, a brief video. Uh, but we were able to see a couple of Um, I noticed that um, the teacher, at least the one that did the thing with the counters, um, he kept it really brief. He just said, what if you did this and then sort of sent them back to go and try it out? Yeah, thanks, Ms. Lau. Um, yeah, and I think he, he did a great, great job of modeling that that idea of being brief, right? Um, that, that's <laughs> super brief. <laughs> Yeah, in, in some cases, super brief. But um, he also did a good job of, um, in that in that same fashion, simplifying the problem. Um, similar to the idea of removing numbers, he simplified the problem. He made the problem simpler and then had them expand upon it later. Um, Ms. Martin, I think I saw you drop something in the chat um, briefly, briefly modeling for them. Yep. And Chantel saying, intellectually engage the students, hook them into the lesson by asking what if. Yep, I think the what if questions work really nicely in catch and release as well. And uh, Etienne says, prompting students to explain in what they did on one of the steps. That'll help also spark ideas among other students. And yeah. notice, I think what stood out to me, Gabe, is that the teacher never confirmed or denied what, whether the students thinking and what they tried was right, right? Mm -hmm. So it was still kind of left on the students to then, hmm, well, maybe I should try that. Like, will that work? Did that work? Yeah, absolutely. And um, in the case of the, one of the teachers, um, the second teacher that we 
verbal numbers. Um, she did a good job of bringing in the student work also. Um, she was very intentional about the students that she called upon uh, because their strategy was something that other students could benefit from. Um, so that was a, a quick snapshot of, of what it could look like um, as, as far as the catcher release. Uh, we're now going to share with you a couple of samples of referrals and we'll, we'll have a chance to play with Desmos, which uh, I think somebody mentioned earlier um, in the chat as uh, an instructional tool that we can use. So uh, we'll play around with Desmos. Um, Tanaga is going to share a activity link where we'll get to experience um, this Desmos as a student. Uh, and then Tanaga will also be able to share with you what it looks like from her teacher dashboard. Um, so each of these slides in the Desmos activity represents a potential referral that you can give to students. Uh, for a couple of referrals, are just kind of uh, some strategies or some questions that students might ask themselves as they're working through. And then the last three are some graphic organizers um, that you can copy this at Desmos activity and then use for uh, when working with your students. Uh, so let's take a moment, click on the Desmos link. Um, as you all are signing in, if you're looking at Tanaga's screen, she can kind of And at any moment, she can click on the or our student slide and see in real time what this great way is doing. Couple of minutes. So if you're in there right now under your student account, you're able to click through and see the five different examples of referrals. And on my screen, if you look back in the Nearpod, or in the WebEx, sorry, not the Nearpod, go back to the WebEx. <laughs> You've got like a thousand windows open. Go back to the WebEx and you'll be able to see, this is what the teacher sees on their end. So I can see three of you right now are in slide one, four of you are in slide two, and I'm just gonna click on this one. And you can see, I can see that I thought somebody was. If Courtney starts typing on slide three, then I'd be able to see what she's writing there. Um, Maybe uh, let's click on uh, Karam and slide four to see what he inputted there. Perfect, there we go. So you can see as the teacher there, I can see what he's writing. Um, and in this particular template, the students would record three things that they have done and then one thing that they plan or can do next. And maybe this would be a good point uh, to do a catch and release, right? If students are having trouble about figuring out, well, what's the next thing I can do? That might be a time when you stop, you catch everybody together, you discuss what people have done, and then you release them after they've heard multiple groups share what they have done, then they might be able to come up with something else that they're gonna do next to help try and solve the problem. Um, that's okay, Chantelle, you can just um, look at what's happening on the screen. I'm gonna click through a few more for you, but you can see, and I'll also share all the links at the end. Yeah, so this Desmos activity can be copied by um, any teacher here. You can delete slides, add slides, um, you'll also notice on some of these slides, students can draw pictures um, so they can sketch what they're doing. Um, they can also create a table, create a graph. Um, obviously, some skills that we want our secondary students to do. Um, so here we're seeing Miss Martin kind of work live time. She's about to draw something. There she goes. That's Jet's finest. Right I think there. I did that. I did that. <laughs> um, I did that, but a student could do that. Let's see. Is anyone? Uh, 
in that three things I've done. Let's take a look at like slide five. There. Okay. Etienne, I'm going to go there where you are. You want to draw in there for us, Etienne, so we can see? Okay, great. So he put something in the table there so we can see that. And there's a graph there. And you put the graph in the Desmos, correct, Gabe? You put that yeah, tool there. So the But graphically, visually, people and I think also the connection between multiple. Um, so this was a very quick demo of Desmos. I I am a huge fan and supporter of Desmos and Dan Meyer, um, who's the CEO of Desmos. Um, we can probably do a whole series on Desmos, um, <laughs> but we did want to show you how referrals can be used in a digital space and how um, teachers we can um, get in and see kind of student thinking as it's um, as it's happening. Uh, Miss Sowers, you can't write on the graph, but, but you can um, students can input like um, values in a table and then it would graph the points um, and then the graph can also connect those points. But a student can't like scribble on the graph paper. Um, there is a way you can do that, but in that particular um, in the way that I created that, that that's not how it would, how it would go. Um, so we're going to take some uh, time to ref, uh, to reflect on some of the things that were shared, and for that, I'm going to hang it hang it to um, Tanaga. Thanks. And I just put the link. The second Desmos link that I put in the chat is if you want to copy that activity Gabe made for your own class. And we also have. Um, let me put one more link in the chat. Also for the, if you are not familiar with Desmos and um, you'd rather use like a Google doc or um, one of the other collaborative doc tools, uh, Gabe also made those three or I'm sorry, he made those referrals into a Google doc as well. So we'll share those um, as another resource. All right, so we gave you five different instructional moves tonight that you could use to support students when they're actually struggling in your math class um, and struggling in a good way, right? Um, so we wanna take some time now to be intentional and set aside um, some reflection to think about, okay, of those strategies, how might I apply that to my work and what might that look like? So. In a moment, we're going to go to a Padlet and share our thinking as we've done with the other um, reflection times during this series. But I want to just first give us some quiet think time about which of those instructional moves resonated with you and think about why. Or maybe you have an idea about a referral for something that's coming up in your course that you'd like to share with others. Um, and so that might be another uh, opportunity to reflect and share right now. So we'll give you about one minute to think about that and then I'll put the Padlet link in the chat and it'll also be in the Nearpod for you to uh, record on the next slide. Thank you. 
All right, you should now see the Padlet and be able to click right into it from um, your Nearpod. And I'll also share it in the chat box. If you weren't able to get in the Nearpod, you can always just click on it there as well. So which of those five instructional moves resonates most with you and your students and why? Set the stage, catch and release, referrals, metacognitive questions, remove the numbers or three reads. And you can add your response by clicking the plus button and typing in the box uh, that appears. A couple of ideas coming in. Ms. McDonald says, remove the numbers. My students struggle with reading and understanding word problems. So this strategy might help them work them out prior. Another person saying, remove the numbers. That'll also be very helpful. They're still typing, so I'll give them a moment to finish. Three reads, really helping the students who struggle with the word problems. Word problems are such a beast, aren't they? Couple of referrals, um, algebra tiles. Ooh, I found a really good one. Let me add it to the Padlet. I found a good one. I went to the NCTM conference this past um, week and there was a really good algebra tiles one that I was not familiar with before. I think it was called Nathagon. I'll add that one on there to whoever wrote the algebra tiles one. Jenna says referral that my students use after annotating word problems is a no and need to know chart. Good, students write down the no's that they highlighted in their annotation. A couple people liking that one. Online calculator, graphing one specifically. Please do share, share the link for that online calculator for others that might be wanting to use that. A couple people writing about catch and release. So important to launch an activity model for students and then allow them to explore and learn on their own. I like three reads so we can eliminate extra words and just leave the skeleton of the problems. Three reads seems to be the winner tonight. <laughs> That's a real popular one. We, we might have to do another session on mathematical language routines. Another series. Yeah, I um, <laughs> I actually got to meet and work with Harold Asterius. I had to do it. He's uh, one of the researchers that um, started that three reads routine. Um, so really cool, humble guy. Very excited. All right, so we are nearing the end of our time together. We really enjoyed doing this series and sharing ideas with you all and hearing your ideas as well. It really makes for a great math community. A special thanks to Gabe for joining in with me on this, this work. Um, 